So this question is about how derivatives affect the shape of a graph. So um, this function is a polynomial that's given in kind of a weird way here. So, so there's f. Um, if you look ahead a little bit to part uh, c, we're eventually going to be, to be graphing the shape of f. And we haven't done this in class yet, so um, let me just walk you through it step by step. So A is easy. A is something we definitely need, uh, we definitely know how to do, right? Find the critical numbers, that is, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve. So let's do that, all right? I have to use the product rule to take the derivative of f. So think of this as one part, this is another part. So you get 4x cubed times x minus 1 uh, cubed plus x to the fourth times 3 times x minus 1 squared, okay? And we have to set this equal to 0 and, and solve it. It's not totally easy to solve, right? What would you do? The right thing to do is to factor out everything in common between these two parts. So you'll notice they have a lot of stuff in common. So I can factor out, um, they both have at least th uh, three x's. I can factor out an x cubed. I can also factor out an x minus one squared. Okay, and what is left? So here I'm left with four um, times x minus one. There's one of those left. And over here I have a three and one of these x's gets left behind and that's all, okay. The stuff in brackets can become a little bit more simple. I have x cubed x minus 1 squared and in brackets I have 4x minus 4 plus 3x equals 0 and let me collect those x's inside the brackets. And that gives x cubed times x minus 1 squared times, this becomes 7x minus 4 equals 0. Okay. All right. And the solutions to this will be our critical numbers. And so you know how to factor a polynomial, right? You just look at each part in the factorization and you ask what makes that part zero, and then all those together are all the zeros of the polynomial. So what makes this first part zero, x cubed? Well, just the input zero, okay? So I'm listing the zeros of the polynomial. One is zero because of this part. You can see if I put one in here, that becomes zero. So one is another zero. And if you need to solve this one off to the side, go ahead and do that. But you can, you can see that the solution there is four over seven, okay? So I have my three critical numbers, and since those are so important to the problem, maybe I should copy them, right? So we just did part A. Let me push all this stuff down. And I want to remember my critical numbers. There they are. So B says use the first derivative test uh, what is that? To determine whether each of these critical points gives a local maximum, a local minimum, or neither. So let me say a couple things about what the what the first derivative test is. Also has a Wikipedia page, which you can look at if you want. Okay. Um, so let me just draw a function. So this is this is regular f. I mean, it's not this f, but. So this is a graph of the function that you're given, and look at a look at a place like like this. Okay, so this is a critical number. You know, with the polynomial, all the critical numbers are going to be just places where the derivative is zero. Um, actually, maybe let me change my picture a little bit. So a place where the derivative is zero doesn't have to be an extremum. It could be a point like this. Okay. So see how the derivative is zero here? We call that a saddle point. I'm going to call this a saddle point. Okay. And this is a this is a local min, and this is a local max. Let me call these c1, c2, and c3. Okay. So imagine that these are the critical points that you get for a certain function. Um, all right. So 
with the picture, it's obvious that C1 is a local max. But what if all you know is that the derivative is 0 at C1? How could you tell whether C1 was a local max, a local min, or a saddle point? And so the first derivative test is exactly what answers that question. So the way it works is like this, OK? It has something to do with the first derivative, right? So consider, consider C1 here, the local max case. So if it's a local max, then just to the left of the point, um, you're going to have a positive slope, right? So this is saying that f prime is positive here. It's positive right before because the slope is positive, but it becomes negative right after. Okay? So if f prime, I'm not going to write this down, I guess. Maybe I should over here to the side. Um, so if f prime goes uh, positive to minus at c, then c is a local max. And now I think if you pause the machine and just think about these other cases, you can guess what I'm going to say, but let's go through it. So look at C2 here. So C2 is a local min, right? What does the derivative do right around there? Well, right before C2, the derivative is going to be negative because that's a negative slope. And right after, it's going to be positive, okay? So this, that's, what a, that's what a local min looks like. So if f prime goes minus to plus at C, C is a local min, uh, low, local, all right? And this is the last case, all right? So um, the saddle point is kind of weird. You could have a down saddle point as well as an up saddle point, right? So keep that in mind. It could look like this. So what happens to the derivative near C3? It's another place. It's another critical point. So just to the left of C3, the derivative is positive because the slope of that line is positive. But just to the right of C3, it's still positive. Okay. So the sign of the derivative does not change at C3. So if the sign of f prime does not change at C, then C is a saddle point. And that's all there is to it, um, okay? So maybe you can just jot those down and, and we'll use these facts to do to do the rest of the problem. Right. So B, use the first derivative test to determine whether each of these critical points gives a local maximum, a local minimum, or neither. So here we go. So I like to do it like this. I like to draw a, a horizontal line. And let's just think of this as the number line. Okay, so this is R, the real numbers. And let me put a point on the number line for each of these. So there's going to be one at zero. And there's going to be another one at, uh, what is four over seven? Four over seven is a little bit more than a half. It's definitely less than one. And here is one, okay? Um, all right, so the way you, what you have to do now is you have to check the sign of f prime on each piece. All right. Um, so how do you do that? Well, it's enough just to pick a to pick a sample point. You want the sample point to be actually inside the interval. So for instance, you don't want to pick zero. You want to pick something that's actually inside. So we can pick a sample point, negative one here. You know, you could use a sample point, one half is in there. And you could use a sample point, maybe five over seven is a good one here. And I don't know, two, okay? So those are my sample points. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug each of these into F prime and see if what comes out is positive or negative.
So this will this is how I'm learning about the, the way f prime changes sine. Okay, so um, I have deleted f prime, but maybe I can remember what it is. Did we take out what did we take out here? So we took out x cubed from both parts. And we took out, I think it was two x minus ones, right? Yeah, okay. X minus one squared, and then what was left over is um, seven x minus four. Okay, all right, so there it is. So as you go along here, I mean, you could just do the hard work of actually plugging in the value, right? But it's enough just to check the sign of each piece. So let me go through it. Oh, what, what is that? Don't do that. So um, look at negative one here, okay? I can just ask myself, does negative one make this part negative or positive? Well, negative cubed is negative. So this is a negative piece. Negative one is gonna be, it's gonna be positive no matter what because of this square. So this part is plus. And if I plug negative one in here, it's definitely gonna be negative, right? So the whole thing is gonna be something negative times something positive times something negative and that's going to come out to be positive, right? Okay. So on this whole piece here, we know that f prime is, is plus. So now let's go through and do it for each of these other regions. Now I'm going to go on to the next region. Okay. So I look at my sample point in the next region as one half, and I just ask myself for each piece, is one half going to make it positive or negative? So one half cubed is definitely positive, right? and the square is always going to make this point part positive. So actually, this, you could probably just cross this part out. It's never going to be relevant. And uh, if you put in 1 half here, you get 3.5 minus 4 is going to be negative. So if you multiply positive times positive times negative, it's going to be negative, okay? So this whole part here is negative. All right, and that's done. Maybe I should shade it purple as we go along. So I'll erase my chicken scratches, and you know ahead of time that this one's going to be positive because of the square. So what happens at 5 over 7? Um, 5 over 7 cubed is, is positive, and uh, 5 over 7, 7 times 5 over 7 is 5 minus 1 over 7, it's plus. Um, okay, so plus times plus times plus is going to be plus, so this is a positive part, and we're done with that part, okay. And so one, one place left to go, one more sample point. I'm going to erase these sample points because they're kind of distracting me. Okay, one left to go, that's two. So what happens when you plug two in? This is still going to be positive. This is still going to be positive. What about this thing? Yeah, it's still going to be positive, okay? So for this last part, we're going to have positive times positive times positive. Okay, so now if you've forgotten what the first derivative test is, you need to pause the video and remind yourself what the first derivative test says. But what have we learned? We've learned that at the critical point zero, the function goes from a positive slope to a negative slope. That means zero is, a, is where a local max occurs. So we agreed about that before. So if the sign of the derivative changes from positive to negative at a critical point, you have a local max. All right, now consider this one. The derivative changes from minus to positive. That means the original curve f looks something like that. And that means that a local min occurs at this critical point. Okay, and one last little thing here. Here's one. Now the function doesn't change sign at all. It goes from plus to plus. So if you look back at the statement of the first derivative rule, you can see that that means that this is going to be a saddle point. And you can actually kind of sketch it if you think about it. So plus means the function is increasing, then the derivative is zero, then it's increasing some more. Okay, all right. So yeah, and for the first derivative test, I mean, I guess I didn't say this, but you need, you need f to be differentiable on the part that you care about. So we're, we are done with B. Okay, so B was use the first derivative test to determine which, whether each of these critical points gives a local maximum, a local minimum, or neither. So this is what we learned. We learned that 0 is a local max, that 4 over 7 is a local min, 
and that one is a saddle point. And we even know that it's this kind of saddle point as opposed to the, the downward saddle. Okay. So for the last thing, the last part of this question, we're supposed to give a little sketch of the function. So I know that probably makes some people sad. But look how much we already know about the function. Um, I, can even, I can even sketch little pieces of it. Let me get myself some good axes going. Um, so here's a, here's a big y-axis, and here's an x-axis. Okay, all right. So we care about the function at a few of these values. So now let me label where the critical points are. So there's one here at 0. And let's call this uh, 4 over 7. And let's put 1 right about here, OK? All right. Um, so I can, I, can plot, I can plot where the function is at each of these critical points. That's not hard, right? So where is the function at 0? Well, to see that, just plug 0 into the original function. If you plug 0 in here, what is f of 0? Well, f of 0 is 0, OK? So that is a, that's one point on the curve here. Maybe I'll put a little red dot there just to show that I've considered it. OK, so this is actually a point on the curve. Now let's go up to 4 over 7. So what is f of 4 over 7? It's not going to be anything too wonderful, is it? It's going to be 4 over 7 cubed. Um, and what is this? This is going to be um, 4 over 7 minus 7 over 7 is minus 3 over 7. So you have minus 3 over 7 uh, cubed. And I did something stupid here. This is not a cube. It's the fourth power. Sorry about that. Okay. So what is this? What is this horrible number? I don't know. I should have figured out what it was beforehand, but I didn't. I'm sorry. Um, but it's going to be it's going to be a negative number, right? So I'm just going to put just going to put a negative dot here. So it's somewhere down there. And what happens when you plug 1 into the function? Let me make myself some room. So f of 1 is this 1 to the 4th doesn't matter. It's going to be 0. OK, great. It's 0. OK. So going back to red here. All right, <coughs> so I need I know that I need to draw the, the curve through these points. I know actually what happens kind of locally around these points because in the second part of the question, I learned I learned these things. I learned that zero is a local max, and so that means that in the neighborhood of zero, the function's going to be going like that, right? And I learned that four over seven is where a local min occurs. So in the neighborhood of four over seven, it's going to be going something like this. and um, over here at uh, at one, there's going to be a saddle point, so it's going to be something like that. Okay, it's supposed to go through with a little saddle. And if I connect these, oops, then that that's good enough. Okay, so I said in the instructions that I should I should label these points. So I guess I should label this point as four over seven comma f of four over seven terrible number. And that's good enough. Maybe I could even draw this a little better. Just if I were to draw it smoothly, it would look something like this, OK? And notice that this is, this is consistent with, with what you what should be able to do based on what you learned in pre-calculus. In pre-calculus, you talk about how to graph a polynomial for a few class periods. And you don't need to remember that stuff now, because you know things that are better. Um, but if you if you want to just think about how you would do it, this this even power means that you bounce at four. I mean, bounce at the zero root, right? And um, this this odd power here means that you go through kind of like x cubed. And then at some point you turn around and um, you know that the global shape of the function is like this because it's an odd polynomial with a positive leading coefficient. So if you found those those last things that I said confusing, then just forget about them. So this is good enough. And that's how you do that question, and it's over.